Got it. Okay. Let me open with a word of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful to you that you have always been present in the world that you created, that you have acted in history, from the history of creation to the history of Abraham and the call of your people to the history of becoming incarnate, your son and Jesus Christ on earth, and then the work that you have done in the 2,000 years since to make your will known through your servants, the church. We pray that you would open our minds and hearts, your Holy Spirit, to protect and direct us as we learn more of you. May we have a great sense of the drama that is the church militant down through history as we have served you and continue to serve you even today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, today's class is entitled Persecutions, Heresies, and the Book. And I'm going to get all that in there plus a little bit more, as you'll find out as we go along. This, again, is the schedule for this class. It has not changed. Somebody was asking about changing the calendar. We, I did, did change the titles of the weekly lectures on uh, the Thursday class, the Life and Teaching of Jesus. This hasn't changed. So today we will look at persecution heresies in the book. Next week, emperors, bishops, saints, and intellectuals. Week five, councils, monks, popes, and Augustine, one of only three people I named uh, in my titles. Week six, schisms, barbarians, and Gregory the Great. There's number two. And then week seven, Charlemagne, cathedrals, crusades, and scholastics. And week eight, poverty, inquisition, and Babylonian captivity. And that's all just in one hour. And then the second hour, we're going to deal with uh, the final exam. About three quarters of the way through the class, I will give you a, a document that tells you all of the things that you need to know for the final, which I believe are all the things you ought to know when you come out of this class. Related to that, one of the reasons that I do this each time is to make sure you're clear where we're going. Today, I'm going to give you a lot of different names and some dates, but do, because they're people you need to be exposed to, you need to have heard their name, you have, need to have some sense, at least in the back of your mind, if not in the front of your mind, as to who these people were and why their name has come down into history. Um, in a number of cases, I'm using these names because these people represented something larger. They represented, for instance, the apologist movement, which I will tell you what that is, or they were one of the most noteworthy of the uh, apostolic fathers, and I will tell you what that's all about. Um, so they may be, I may give you those names as representative. Any of them that particularly stand out that you need to really remember who they were to have a grasp of Christian history, I will make sure that you that's identified for you. You'll be introduced to them today and in the days and weeks ahead. But on the document, what you need to know about Church History 1, I will identify. For instance, Justin Martyr, one of the great theologians and writers of the early church who was also one of the early martyrs. You need to know a little bit more about Justin Martyr than what I'm going to just mention in passing today. There are others that you'll hear their name, and you might be interested to look them up on Wikipedia sometime, but other than that, I don't expect them to be front of mind, okay? But they may represent something or be part of a group that you need to be aware of what they did. Fair? Is that clear? Okay. Today, we are going to be looking at a number of different themes. Um, we're going to start out looking at the Apostolic Fathers, and I'll start out by explaining to you who that is. There are a number of different kinds of fathers, quote unquote, in the early church, and I'll give you kind of an overview of some of the big groupings, because it gets confusing when there's four or five different kinds of father groups that are talked about. Um, secondly, we're going to talk about persecutions, the persecutions that existed for the church up until the legalization of Christianity, which happened in the early 300s under Constantine. The persecutions the church experienced in terms of sort of empire-wide were all in the first uh, three centuries, so we'll talk about that. Then the Christian, and, and why those persecutions? We'll talk about the Christian apologists. That's with a capital A because that's a particular group of people in the history of the church. Uh, an apologist is not somebody who apologizes. An apologist is somebody who defends or explains. That's what apology means in Greek. It means to give a defense for. So we have Christian apologists today. C.S. Lewis was a Christian apologist. G.K. Chesterton, one of my heroes, was, a, was an uh, apologist. Ravi Zacharias, uh, R.C. Spruill, all those modern people are apologists. They give explanations or defenses of the faith. But the Christian apologists that, ha that were in predominantly the second century uh, of the Christian calendar, A.D., were there for a very specific reason, and uh, we'll talk about that. It is related to the persecutions and the reasons for the persecutions. 
Then we're going to talk about heresies, at least some of the major heresies, probably five of the major heresies that were, uh, the church had to deal with, and why they affected them. In fact, to a great extent, our New Testament canon is, is a result of one of the heresies that existed in the second century, the heresy of Marcion. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then the Christian theologians, as, a, as, as opposed to the Apostolic Fathers or the Christian apologists, the theologians were the ones who came along who began to develop more systematic explanations of the faith rather than just address single problems at a time, which is what most everybody had done before that. Similar to the fact that the letters of Paul, um, the epistles of Paul are almost all, well, they are all, um, written to one individual or one church, and most of them deal with an issue that church or person had. You then get the Catholic epistles in our New Testament, Catholic meaning universal. They're not written to an individual or to an individual church. They address larger issues. In the same way, after the, the, the scripture was written, we have people like the Christian apologist who address specific kinds of issues. But at a certain point, when you had big heresies like Marcionism or Gnosticism, we'll talk about, that had their own sort of comprehensive view of things, there had to be a more comprehensive explanation coming from the Christian side as to why that isn't what we believe and what do we believe. And so we have the period of the Christian theologians or the Christian teachers, they're sometimes called. Then we want to talk about how we actually did develop the canon. Canon meaning the scripture, how we got our New Testament canon. And then I'm going to talk briefly related to that, probably very briefly, about the start of the creeds and also the issues like apostolic uh, succession. Some of the issues that the Protestant Reformation had the most trouble with, like um, the whole penance idea, you know, that you do penance for having committed sins that the Reformers had so much problem with. There are very real historic reasons why those things were brought into existence. It wasn't just that somebody came up with that one day. They were in response to something that had to do with history. Okay? We're going to talk about all those things. So I want to give you an overview. They always say, tell people what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So that's sort of what we're working with. This is what I'm going to tell you. Any questions about any of that? Just start now. Obviously, I'm going to give you explanations for almost all of that. So, Okay. Let's start out talking about the Apostolic Fathers. The Apostolic Fathers were those leaders of the church who came after the deaths of the Apostles. You will remember last week we dealt with the Apostolic period, which meant as long as any of the Apostles were still alive. The Apostle John, who lived the longest, died somewhere in the late 90s, almost at the very end of the first century. So generally speaking, from the ascension of Jesus until the end of the first century, because that's when John died, is the apostolic period. Immediately after that is the post-apostolic period, or the period of the apostolic fathers. These were men, and they were all men, um, who were reputed to have known and learned from the apostles. So that they were the next generation, if you will, of the church after the apostles. Their writings were highly regarded. In fact, in several instances, we don't know who the people were. We just know them. We know whoever it was that wrote this was of that time period and reflected the knowledge of the apostles that suggested they were one of the apostolic fathers. And um, some people in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries even, up until probably the, the late 4th century, there were still some people who believed that some of the writings of the uh, Apostolic Fathers, like some of the writings of Clement of Rome, 1st Clement, 2nd Clement, I'm just going to give you this list, I'm going to talk about a few of these, that some of these writings should be in the Bible. But um, because they believed that these people had connection, direct connection to the Apostles, in the same way, say, that John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, he was not an Apostle, but he was an assistant and uh, secretary to Peter, after having first had a relationship with Paul and Barnabas, but later with Peter, and so his writing was considered appropriate for the for Scripture because he was he was reporting from his relationship with an apostle. Well, some people thought the same thing about some of these guys, and yet there were reasons why the decision was made later on that their writing would not be canonical, but it was held in very very high regard. Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about the fathers thing. Uh, the Apostolic Fathers were, uh, as I said, the second generation, the next generation after the Apostles who were believed to have relationships with, to be friends with, to have learned from, to have been disciples of the Apostles themselves. You'll run across a number of different references. You will read about the early church fathers. 
which is basically the same as the Apostolic Fathers, but probably go a little further. It's another, it, they can do two or three generations. In fact, when they talk about church fathers, some people say the last church father was John of Damascus in the 600s. Some people say that the last church father was, was Bernard of Clairvaux, who lived in the second millennium. I mean, you, you know, like 1200. Um, that's some people, mostly Catholics, mostly people who were part of the, you know, the, the orders that Bernard started. But for the most part, when they say early church fathers, you'll also see, see the term and, uh, the um, anti-Nicene fathers. Early church fathers, anti-Nicene fathers means the same thing. Anti-Nicene, what does anti mean? Before. Before. Yeah. Before. Before. What does Nicene mean? Birth. It was a Nicene council. council. Nicene oh, yeah. council, yeah. yeah. The Council of Nicaea in 326, actually it was a little longer than that, which was the first great council of the church under the Emperor Constantine, who was the first one who made Christianity legal. Everything changed in the early 300s. So when they say the early church fathers, or sometimes the anti-Nicene fathers, they mean the people, the, the leaders of the church that existed between the apostles and the legalization of the church in the early 300s. So during that uh, second and third century. You sometimes will see the desert fathers. There were a number of monks, three of, three of the most important of whom were brothers, who, um, I, actually, I just confused something. The uh, Desert Fathers were in the Egyptian desert, uh, started by Anthony the Great, St. Anthony, who went down there and started a monastery and created monastic orders for both men and women. And so many people came down there and joined him in these monasteries that one, one writer at that time, and this was in the, first, the end of the first start of the second century, they observed that the desert has become a city. There were thousands and thousands of monks and nuns who would come down there well, the leaders of that movement, starting with St. Anthony and others, were called the Desert Fathers because they were very early on in the first century, second century, and they too had writings. You have the Cappadocian Fathers. Cappadocia is a region in uh, Turkey, ancient Asia Minor, or Anatolia, sometimes called. It's sort of a central region, quite remote. There was a woman there who was an abbess. She ran um, a monastery for nuns, <laughs> a nunnery. And she had three brothers, all three of whom were very spiritual. And so she provided a place for them to live and work and study and have their needs met. And those three brothers all became great leaders and theologians and writers for the church. They were all three philosophers, and they linked philosophy of that day to the Christian faith. And then one of their best friends joined them. So those four, three brothers and then Gregory of uh, Nazianzus, were all... Um, called the Cappadocian Fathers, because they, again, came in that second century period. So, you get this idea uh, that there, when we say fathers or church fathers, the early post-apostles, post after the apostles, but before the church was made legal, those people who helped define the Christian faith and Christian theology and helped lead the church and helped deal with the problems of the church and respond to heresies, those leaders and writers, and many of whom were martyrs, especially in the second century, were the church fathers, okay? The apostolic fathers is a subset of that. These are the ones that were considered immediately after the apostles and linked to them in some way. Modern historians and scholars now believe that very few of the apostolic fathers actually had a direct relationship with any of the apostles, but uh, tradition had that they were, they certainly did in principle, if not in actuality, okay? So let's talk about a couple of these. Clement of Rome is one of the first ones um, Part, part of the first generation. He was active late in the first century. In fact, his most famous writing is a letter called First Clement. He wrote it from Rome, but he wrote it to Corinth. And in his letter, he acknowledges the fact that the Corinthians had, been, had, had a relationship with Paul and had received letters from Paul. Um, but Clement sort of reestablishes for them some of the authority that Paul had, that the church had over him. And he writes to them about succession of leaders. And in fact, Clement is one of the first ones to introduce the idea of apostolic succession. Do you know what apostolic succession means? We're going to talk about it, you know, why it happened and the importance later, but just in definition, because Clement wrote about it in the 90s, 1890s, um, it means that a person who is a minister in the church should have been ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who was ordained by an apostle. 
The idea behind that is that if each person from the apostles, if the apostle had a disciple, an acolyte, a student that they taught, then they got the right teaching because the apostles all had it right. Well, if that person is then true to that and teaches the next person in the next generation and then the next generation, the idea is that you've got a better chance that the teaching that has been passed down to the leadership of the church continues to be consistent with what the apostles taught. And the apostles were seen, because scripture was written by the apostles or those close to the apostles, as being the most what Jesus intended, the most what is what's scriptural. Whereas if you got people coming in here from left field who have, have no link to that, then who knows where they're coming from or what their teaching has been or whatever. Now, today, very few Protestant churches maintain a rigid apostolic succession. Instead, our emphasis is on biblical uh, accuracy. We look at Scripture and say, are you true to Scripture? Because historically, there's been a breakdown in all of that. I was not ordained by someone who was ordained by someone who was ordained down the road by an apostle. So... And in fact, to some people, that's still a big deal. I was, I was asked after I became minister here, well, if you weren't ordained in apostolic succession, then what right do you have to offer the sacraments? Ooh, well, apparently I'm not going to offer them to you. <laughs> um, again, we now hold to, are you true to the biblical teaching? Which was the whole point of apostolic succession anyway. The apostles representing the true biblical teaching. But Clement is one of the ones that when the church in, um, in Corinth was talking about having new leadership, he taught them in first, the letter of 1 Clement about uh, how they needed to have and why they needed to have apostolic succession. It's also from the letter of 1 Clement in the fifth chapter, because this was broken up in chapters 2, that we learn about the fate of, of Peter and Paul in Rome, because Clement was in Rome. And he's writing in the last second half of the first century, which was when Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome. So this is one of the most direct testimonies we have of that. Um, Clement also wrote a second letter of Clement, which appears to be more of a transcript of a sermon. And it's a little funky. <laughs> it's, I say that because there's some stuff in it that's, that sounds right, and there's some stuff in it that sounds like the Gnostic writings. You know, the Gospel of Thomas, those of you who are in the class where I was reading the passage from the Gospel of Thomas, well, this is a passage from, um, and this is probably why Clement, neither of Clement's letters were ever accepted in the canon, because Second Clement has this in it. For the Lord himself, being asked by a certain person when the kingdom would come, said, when two shall be one, and the outside is the inside, and the male with the female, neither male nor female. <laughs> that sounds more like the Gospel of Thomas than it does the Gospel of Mark. Okay? And so I think that's probably why Clement was not accepted. But as one of the early fathers of the church, much of his writing is of terrific value. I mean, we don't want to discount everything else just because he's got a couple of weirdos in it. Um, but, and again, for the most part, his stuff is very sound and it teaches us much about what the church was saying and doing immediately post apostle period. Okay? Um, a second that we have, well, we don't know the person's name, but the author of the Didache. The Didache is a document. Didache literally means the teaching, you know, uh, didactic. You know the word didactic? It means to teach or a, uh, a teaching style. Um, it also was known as the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. It was written probably before 70 AD. So we're talking about most of these things being during the life when some of the apostles were still alive. But then it was popularized and was being used well into the second century. It focuses, it's, it's sort of an early Jewish Christian document. It's, it's clearly got some Jewish influence in it, as you would expect, having been written before 70 AD, uh, when the church was still predominantly, not totally, but still predominantly Jewish. Um, it deals with uh, a presentation of the gospel as being the two ways, meaning the way of the spirit and the way of the flesh. That we are to seek the way of the spirit, which is interestingly enough, in Galatians this morning, we were talking about exactly that thing. That was the, the theme in uh, Galatians 5. Um, so, the Didache relies heavily on Matthew's Gospel, which, again, is the most Jewish of the Gospels, and it's believed that it may have actually been related to the early Jewish Christian uh, sect called the Ebionites, which we know, probably most of you know more, as the Judaizers. There's an indication, although not obvious in the Didache, that the person who wrote it may have believed that you needed to follow the law of Moses in addition to believing which was the whole thing, the Judaizers, Ebionites, we're going to talk about, that was the technical historical name for them, 
that Paul was so much, so much against. But the Didache still is sort of like an early minister's manual. It talks about how to do baptism, fasting, prayer, how to serve the Lord's Supper, how to take care of traveling ministers, uh, all kinds of things. Um, and, and it's got some fascinating instruction in terms of not being too dogmatic about this stuff. Um, for, for instance, in how you baptize. We talked again today about the fact that some people say you don't get completely submerged, you're not really baptized. Well, this document of the early church, which was before AD 70, said this. Baptized in this way, having first said all these things, baptized into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in living or running water. That was a Jewish idea. When the Jews had these uh, basins for purification that you would walk that into, it couldn't be water that was just poured in there. There had to be water coming into that and water going out of it. It had to be running water. If you couldn't actually have a river, you had to have water going in and out. So this writer of the Didache is saying you need to baptize in living or running water. But if you have no living water, baptize into other water. And if you cannot do it in cold water, then do it in warm. If you have neither, pour out water three times upon the head in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this document, which is sort of a, man of, a, a manual for ministers, which was written before some of the, the New Testament was written, is identifying the fact that you can baptize in a number of different ways, and it's okay. So those people who say, oh, you have to be completely submerged, not according to the people in the first century, you know, who were teaching ministers how to do these things. All right, we also have, um, I'm not going to spend a lot more time on this, the Epistle of Barnabas, which sometime between 70 and 128 AD, um, it's, it talks, it, it's reputed, although we don't, most scholars don't believe it, they've been written by the Barnabas of the book of Acts. Um, it, it is a letter like other epistles you might think. One of the reasons it probably didn't make it into the canon is it's quite negative about Judaism. Uh, it's, whereas the Didache is quite positive about Judaism, in fact it's very Jewish, maybe too Jewish, the Epistle of Barnabas is very negative against Judaism. Then you have some of the ones who are probably most important in this list, Ignatius of Antioch. Um, I want to talk about Ignatius for a few minutes. Ignatius was born right around the time Jesus died. So his life was the, the life of the apostles, very similar to that. Um, he, he had the title, which apparently everybody acknowledged, as being Ignatius of Antioch, the bearer of God. He was seen as one who brought God with him. Okay. So a very significant leader in the church. Um, great prestige in the whole Christian community around the Eastern Mediterranean. For one reason or another, we don't know exactly why, during um, late in the first century, Ignatius was arrested, he was tried, and he was condemned to die. Now, um, after he was condemned to die, a number of individual Christians came to visit him, especially leaders in the church. Um, people who were ministers, a bishop, representatives of other churches came to visit him before he was actually killed. And he responded to their visits with letters. And he would write back to him. In fact, there are seven of those letters that are still extant. So the letters of Ignatius, written to various churches, are encouragements to them to be faithful. Um, and it's important because it gives us kind of a model for the way the, the Christian leadership was developing, even in the first century, in terms of having sort of pastors and then having uh, bishops who would be senior pastors over an area. And in the case of Ignatius, he apparently was bishop over a whole region, and various people were coming to see him. It teaches us a lot. It's very much a pastoral kind of letter. Um, and there's also, and this is critically important, in one of his letters, the letters to the Trollians, it's called, we have what appears to be a very early version of the Apostles' Creed in this writing of Ignatius. He says, for instance, that Jesus Christ descended from David and was also of Mary, who was truly begotten of God and of the Virgin, but not of the same manner. He was crucified and died under Pontius Pilate. Sound familiar? He descended indeed into Hades alone. He also rose again in three days, the Father raising him up, and after spending 40 days with the apostles, he was received to the Father and sat down at his right hand, expecting till his enemies were placed under his feet. Not exactly, but you see phrases there in uh, Ignatius' letter to the Trollians that clearly, uh, or likely, not clearly, but very likely were the source of the Apostles' Creed when it was developed. The, the, the Apostles' Creed, the first great creed of the church, started in the first century and then was formalized later. The next kind of version of it was called the Old Roman Rule, 
which was, you can read what's called the Old Roman Rule or the Old Roman Creed, and it is very similar to what we have today as the Apostles' Creed. And again, some of the phraseology apparently came from uh, Ignatius. We then have Polycarp of Smyrna. I've actually talked about Polycarp several times because we know more about his story than almost anyone. Polycarp had been a student of John the Apostle, John of the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Revelation of John. And I believe that he wrote all five of those. Some scholars don't. I think he did. Um, Polycarp, as a young man, had been a student of John's. And then later on, when he was an old man, Polycarp became bishop of, uh, from Ephesus. He actually was bishop of Smyrna, but Smyrna is not very far from Ephesus. Um, he was arrested under the Roman persecutions. He was offered freedom if he would recant and you know, curse Christ and burn incense to the emperor. He refused to do so. And apparently his judge, the Roman inquisitor, said to him, Well, then away with the atheists. Because Christians, we'll talk about this shortly, one of the accusations was that they were atheists. Because they didn't, they didn't worship the God you, God you could see, they worshiped the invisible God, and they thought that was no God at all, so they were accused of atheism. And when the, when the judge said to Polycarp, well, away with the atheists, Polycarp gestured to all the people sitting in the stands, because this was a public trial, and said, indeed, away with the atheists. Okay. Um, they offered to release him. He was 86, he was much loved. They didn't want to kill him. And they said, all you have to do is curse, curse your Jesus. And he, his response, which is quite famous, is he said, my king and my lord has been, has been good to me my whole life, over 80 years. How can I not deny him? And so he was burned alive. Um, he, they started to nail him to the, to the stake, and he said, the God who gives me, gives me courage to enter the fires will prevent me from leaving. And so he, he left his hands free, and he died praising God, that God has allowed him to give up his life, you know, in testimony to the truth of the gospel. So um, that idea of Polycarp, great leader of the church, one of the uh, apostolic fathers, who we do know had a relationship, all, all testimony is that he had a relationship with John the Apostle earlier, and um, there is a, a document called the Martyrdom of Polycarp, which records that. Some of it may be mythologized a little bit, you know, from the story, but we believe most of it is true, and we do know that he was martyred. We then have uh, Hermas of Rome, whose brother was Pius the Bishop of Rome. He writes an apocalyptic letter called the, Shur uh, the Shepherd of Hermas. Then Papias of Herapolis. I'm not going to go into detail on those. But the idea is, here was a generation uh, of men, really, who stood up, for the truth of the gospel against, in a time when there was persecution, and really kind of solidified that they established the church as being the bridge between the apostles and the post-apostolic period, and really were the linchpins for a lot of what the, the Christian faith maintained in itself. The fact that a number of them, Ignatius and Polycarp, for instance, were willing to go to their deaths as martyrs, gave courage to the rest of the church that... that this is good, this is right, and they were very important in that regard. You can study a lot more about the apostolic fathers. Uh, I want to go now to persecutions. Um, there were officially sanctioned persecution against the church, uh, that is the Christian church, from its very founding. You know, the, remember that the first martyr was Stephen, who was one of the first deacons. Uh, so from the founding of the church until the Emperor Constantine and the Edict of Milan, which um, made Christianity legal in the 4th century, I think that was 311 if I remember right, where it, it was, it, Christianity was not made the official religion of the empire, people often mistake that. It simply was made legal to be a Christian, when it had not been legal under the Roman Empire up until that point. There are a number of different periods of persecution that intensify up to a point until it just stops with the Edict of Milan. In the first century, the first persecutions that the Christian Church knew, we've talked about a little bit in past classes, was the persecution from the Jewish authorities, which we read about in the book of Acts. Again, the, the, the same opposition that the early, that the religious authorities in Jerusalem especially had against Jesus, carried over against his followers, Peter and John, James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus who was over the Jerusalem Council, Particularly, that persecution was targeted toward the Hellenized Jewish Christians, meaning the Jewish Christians who were Greek in their orientation. 
the fact that Stephen was stoned, whereas Peter and John, who were Hebraic Jewish Christians, not Hellenized Jewish Christians, they were beaten and released and told not to preach anymore. That's very different than being stoned, as Stephen was. The indication is that when uh, the persecution after the stoning of Stephen started, and Saul, for instance, got letters of uh, arrest from the Sanhedrin to go to Damascus to capture these, these uh, Jewish Christians who were thought to be heretics and bring them back. Well, we know that most of the Council of Jerusalem that were Jewish, or rather Hebraic Jewish Christians, didn't run for it. They stayed there, and they apparently were okay. Um, the suggestion is that it was almost 20 years later that James, the head of the Jerusalem Council, was killed, and he was not killed. He was killed sort of out of hand by a, a renegade high priest. And in response to that, the people got together and killed the high priest. So, but for the most part, the persecution was against the Hellenized Jewish Christians, so there was some political and cultural ramification to it as well. We read about that in the book of Acts. That was the first organized, official kind of persecution. One of the interesting things about that is during that persecution, the, the Christians who were being persecuted would appeal to their, initially would appeal to the Romans. Remember what Paul did when he was when he was attacked in the courtyards of the temple, and then because there was a little riot going on, the Roman soldiers poured out of the uh, Antonius Fortress, which is connected to the temple courtyards, and rescued Paul. Later on, when the question came up of whether or not they should turn Paul back over to the Sanhedrin to be tried by his fellow Jews, what did Paul do? He appealed to Rome. As a Roman citizen, he had a right to ask Rome to protect him, and so he appealed to Rome, and that's why he traveled to Rome, was shipwrecked and bitten by a poisonous snake out of a fire, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, he appealed to Rome, and that was not uncommon in those days because Rome was the authority. If you were having, you know, Somebody was attacking you and you appealed to the police. Well, the police were the Romans. And so this strange kind of relationship that existed then. But we need to understand that initially the, the Christians were seen as part of the Jewish faith. Now that was both a problem because there was a period of time when the Jews were constantly rebelling against the Romans. For instance, in AD 70, of course, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. Well, Christians did not want to be associated with the Jews for several years before that, even though most Christians were still worshiping in the Jewish temples and synagogues. They still saw themselves as Jews, but completed Jews. They were Jews who knew the Messiah, and so they were encouraging everybody else to. But then, through a period of about uh, 60 years there, up until about 130, in 130 there was another great rebellion, the, the revolt of Bar Kokhba. Um, and when Hadrian was threatening to take Jerusalem and rebuild it and turn it into a city that was dedicated to one of the Roman gods, the Jews rebelled again. And that was crushed. Well, in that last rebellion, when the Jews were getting ready to fight Rome there, the Christians who were still part of the Jewish community in that area went, no, 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 we're out. That's not for us. It's not, that's not something we believe we ought to do. And that was really the final split between Christians and Jews. Particularly, we're talking here about Jewish Christians. People who had grown up Jewish had become believers in Jesus, but still saw themselves as part of the community. And even though there was Jewish persecution in places, uh, there were still many parts of the empire where Jews and Christians continued to meet together. In fact, Origen, later on, actually warns Jewish Christians, stop worshiping at the synagogue! You know, people are not going to be able to tell that you're a follower of Jesus if they see you doing that. So there were problems with that. Mm -hmm. In terms of this initial persecution uh, by Jewish religious authorities, you have to sort of put yourself in their place. How would you feel if, as a Christian, if you were a leader in the Christian church, if a group from your church got together and started declaring that they had a different revelation of God, that they, you know, they had a new leader, and he was God himself, and so they start going to all the other towns around here and recruiting uh, proselytes to their new belief? And I don't think we would respond very well to that. So that's exactly how the Jews felt. They felt like you guys were advocating a different God. You were trying to convert Jews to your faith. You're trying, you know, this is heresy. This is awful. You know, we need to stamp this out before it gets out of control. Well, they didn't. And it did get out of control. Um, <laughs> but that was the first persecution. Then the first official Roman persecution happened in the first century under Emperor Nero. Nero, uh, the period of time, he actually became emperor in 54 AD. 
Um, Nero, many people thought he went crazy later. Early on, he was not a bad emperor. He actually was pretty good. Um, the idea that he fiddled while Rome burned, what happened is in AD 64, Rome burned down. At least about three quarters of it did. The common, the common idea that people had was that he had set it on fire. You all have heard the story of you know, Nero fiddling while Rome burns. Well, historians from that day who should be reliable indicate that's not true. That he wasn't in Rome when this happened, and as soon as he heard about it, he rushed back to Rome, and he worked very hard to try to organize efforts to stop the fire. The fire went on for days and days, destroying, you know, as I say, almost three quarters of the city. And yet, the, the longer after the fire it lit, the more people were blaming Nero. Everybody was saying it was the emperor who did this. And they said that he is a megalomaniac who wanted to burn down Rome in order to rebuild it the way he wanted it. Well, Nero, they kept trying to defuse these accusations. And again, historians seem to indicate Nero didn't really burn Rome. He wasn't guilty of it. But two of the sections of the city that were untouched by the fire were heavily populated by Jews and Christians. Well, Christians weren't very well liked anyway, so Nero says, rather than me get blamed for this one, I didn't do it, I'll blame them. So he started blaming the Christians for it. And that started the first uh, Roman persecution of the Christians. Um, in particular, he, it, and it was isolated. It was isolated to Rome and the regions around Rome. It was not empire-wide by any, any stretch of the imagination. Um, the suggestion was that um, if I'm going to do this, Nero said, then let's make a big show of it, since the point of him blaming the Christians anyway was so that somebody else would get the attention rather than him. So when he started this persecution, he made it um, quite macabre. He would do things like, and I'm, I'm quoting the, the uh, historian Tacitus here. Tacitus said, before killing the Christians, Nero used to amuse the people. Remember, get the people focused on them so they won't be blamed on me. Nero used to amuse the people. Some, some, meaning Christians, were dressed in furs to be killed by dogs. Others were crucified. Still others were set on fire early in the night so that they might illuminate it. Nero opened his own gardens for these shows, and in the circus he himself became a spectacle, for he mingled with the people dressed as a charioteer, and he rode around in his chariot. There are actually paintings of Nero lounging in a party in his gardens while there are crucified Christians who have been soaked in pitch, burning in the background to provide illumination for his garden parties. So it was pretty horrible for those people who were in Rome and in, in the surrounding area. But it was not empire-wide. Then, in 89 AD, after, after Nero's death, that kind of died down, but uh, Domitian became the emperor in 89. In between, Vespasian, who was, and Titus, who were the two generals who destroyed Rome, or destroyed Jerusalem, um, but were good emperors, both of them, as father and son, Vespasian and Titus, they left the Christians alone. They pretty much ignored them. But then in 89, Domitian became the emperor, and they, uh, he, because by this time, Remember, 70 AD was when the temple was destroyed. Um, Domitian is trying to raise more money for the empire because they're financially in not such good shape. So he decides a lot of the Jews are very wealthy. They used to pay um, money to the temple. That was part of their religion. Well, the temple doesn't exist anymore, so you guys can now pay it to me, Domitian said. Pay it to the Roman Empire. So you pay your regular taxes, plus you pay what used to be your religious taxes. Um, so the Jews really were getting it, and again, given this confusion about the difference between Jews and Christians, the Christians got painted with that brush. So it actually started as a persecution against the Jews in order to force them to pay money, and then kind of spread into a persecution against the Christians as well, because the Roman authorities didn't have it clear in their mind that there was a difference at that point. Um, but as in the case of Nero, this does not appear to have been across the entire empire. It was isolated pretty much to Rome. Parts of Asia Minor, you know, because uh, there, there was a big emphasis, in, uh, emphasis of the Roman Empire around uh, Byzantium at that time. In fact, the Roman Empire, we're going to talk later about it splitting in two, with two capitals, Rome and Byzantium, which later became Constantinople, which later became Istanbul. Right? So, but there was a sense in which um, there was a isolated but still very intense persecution. This was the time in which Christians really started being accused of atheism. You don't worship any god anybody can see, which means you don't worship any god, so you're atheists. All right? And because the, his focus was against Jews at this time, because he wanted their money, Domitian 
made it illegal to practice any Jewish practices. Well, a lot of Christians were still associated with the Jewish synagogues. They were, their faith had come out of that. Their leader had been a Jewish rabbi. And so Christians obviously were lined up right in the crosshairs in terms of receiving the punishment for Domitian's uh, rage. Um, and that continued throughout from almost 80, 89 to their uh, middle 90s. And then things seemed to quiet down a little bit again. Then we get into the second century. Second century being the 100s, of course. Yes, Ron? Just clarifying, the first century persecution was mainly against the Hellenized? No, just the, Chris, just the Jewish persecution was against Hellenized. Oh, okay. Under Nero and Domitian, and I don't put emperor in front of all these, but all the names I'm going to use from here on are, are, the, are emperors. Under Nero and Domitian, it was against all of them. See, Nero was after the, the Christians who he accused, tried to put the blame on them, and then Domitian was persecuting the Jews, and he sort of painted the Christians with that brush too, because the separation wasn't very clear to them at that time. Now, in the second century, something very interesting happens. First, we get uh, Hadrian, who begins to persecute, primarily because Hadrian, Hadrian was one of the really good emperors. Hadrian's the one that built the wall all the way across, uh, you know, to keep, keep the Scots out. You know, the wall that separates Scotland from England. The idea was, he decided we've been losing too many people up there. These crazy Scots, you know, they're <laughs> wild men. They keep killing Romans and destroying legions and stuff. Let's just put up a wall, keep them out, and leave them alone. So he was a very practical kind of guy. Um, and yet, he found himself... Um, Persecuted Christians sort of picking up from before. There's something wrong with these people. They're atheists. They're, they don't worship the gods. They're causing problems in that regard. But not intently. Not the kind of persecution that would come later. Then we have a very interesting thing. Trajan, who was also one of the good emperors. In fact, there's a period here called the time of the, of the five good emperors. Hadrian and Trajan were two of those five. Who, they really did seem wise. They stabilized the empire. But, as, and one of the ironies of history some of the most intense persecution against Christians had been done by some of the best Roman emperors. It's not like they were all crazy madmen who were malicious and wanted to hurt people. Some of the hardest persecutions of Christians came under the best emperors. When Trajan comes along, uh, 98 to 117, a very interesting little historical thing happens. And that is that in 111 AD, Trajan assigns uh, the, a, a man named Pliny the Younger as governor of Bithynia. You've probably never heard of Bithynia. Bithynia was a, a province in northern Asia Minor, northern Turkey. Well, Pliny the Younger was apparently a pretty sharp guy. And so he travels up there, and in very short order, he's running into problems. Uh, well, first he recognizes and writes back to Trajan and said, this is really kind of weird, but we have these temples here to the gods, and nobody goes to them. We've got people who sell animals to sacrifice to the gods, and nobody's buying these animals to sacrifice. And when I looked into it, I found out that's because all these people, many of them, have become Christians. And what is this Christian thing? Technically, there was still an edict of persecution against Christians all the way from Nero's time. That had never been wiped off the books, although some of the emperors since then had not paid attention to it. So Pliny, or Pliny, to be more accurate than my Latin here, Pliny writes back to Trajan and says... I've gotten some of these people in here, and I've interrogated them, and I told them, okay, you have to worship the gods. And when they don't, I say, well, if you don't, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and they still don't. And, and so Pliny writes back, and he says, I hate to do it, but mostly I have them executed because they're being so stubborn. Not because they're Christians, but because they're being so stubborn. You know, what's their problem? And Pliny, this is happening so much, and he writes to Trajan, he said, help me out on this, emperor. Should I persecute these Christians and execute them because of something specific they did wrong? Or is just being a Christian bad enough? Since technically that's still illegal. How am I supposed to handle this? Because Pliny, while being a Roman governor, he didn't think much of executing people. Oh, you know, off his head, whatever. Um, still, he wanted to be fair and figure this thing out. So Trajan wrote back to him. It's very important. Trajan wrote back and said... You can't just let them go, because it's still officially illegal to be a Christian, since Nero has been illegal. So if one of them comes to your attention, you have to prosecute them, force them to renounce their faith um, and worship Roman gods. If they don't, then execute them. 
But don't go out looking for them. They have not committed anything that's worth spending all the money it would take you to try to hunt these people down. So don't do anything unless they get turned over to you or accused. From that point on, through most of, not all of, but most of the subsequent persecution of the Romans, that was the situation. The Romans were not going around beating down doors trying to capture Christians. But when a local person decided he had a grudge against someone and accused them of being a Christian, then they would be brought before the judge. That's the only time the Christians were being persecuted. But unfortunately, human nature being what it is, that happened quite a lot. People would come to the, come to the attention. Now later on, there were other things that brought out the fact they were Christians. But at this time, under Trajan, um, the, primarily it was that when pe people accused them of being Christians, that was sufficient. Um, then we have Marcus Aurelius, one of the probably most erudite and intellectual of all the Roman um, uh, governors, and he was, or uh, sorry, emperors. He was one who just really held to keeping Rome great. His whole focus was that he took it as a serious responsibility given to him by the gods to keep Rome great and to serve Rome well and to sacrifice himself. You know, he was a noble leader. You know, a great president. Except part of serving. You know, Rome well meant making sure people obeyed the gods who gave them what they thought was their greatness in the first place. And so even as, as much as he was known as a just man and a great leader, Marcus Aurelius instituted a quite serious persecution against the Christians. And it was in this time that Origen, one of the great leaders, and Justin, who became known as Justin the Martyr, one of the greatest of the early uh, academic leaders of the church, were both persecuted. Um, Marcus Aurelius died in 180, and at that point, at the start of the second or of the third century, we have a man named uh, Septimius Severus. It sounds like a character from Harry Potter. <laughs> Septimius Severus became the emperor, and he instituted a persecution as well. Um, but that takes us into the fourth century. I'm going to touch on these briefly because I'll come back to them. Septimius Severus started persecution because he was not one of the good emperors. And he was not one of the five good emperors. Uh, that had ended you know, up uh, with uh, Trajan. Marcus Aurelius wasn't even on that list, although he was a good leader. Uh, Septim uh, Septimius Severus thought that the way to unify the empire was to unify them all spiritually as well as everything else. And because the, the practice in that day was syncretism, all religions are fine, all gods are okay, everybody's good. He decided to take all of those beliefs, all the religious beliefs in the Roman Empire, and, and uh, subsume them under the worship of the Sol Invictus, which means the invincible sun, the worship of the sun god, which was always, you know, that was always a part of the uh, Roman worship. It, the, some of the emperors who claimed to be divine were seen as the son of the sun, or, you know, the, that kind of stuff. So, he said, everybody's good, you can worship whatever you want to, as long as you also agree to worship the Saul Invictus, the uh, Invincible Son. Well, that very quickly turned into a problem when they talked to Jews and Christians, because neither one of them would do that. And so the persecution that started there, uh, year 202, uh, Septimus Severus issued an edict that said that anyone who did not worship Saul Invictus, no matter whatever else they did, they were uh, defying the empire and therefore would be persecuted. And so that was the period of time in which Irenaeus, one of the other uh, very important early fathers, was martyred. Um, and there are a lot of other stories from this period of time about his, the, the martyrdom of Christians under this edict of Severus. All right? The others, Decius, started a really bad um, persecution in 249. We're going to talk about, we'll touch on these a little bit later because we're getting into the 3rd century then, 4th uh, century I mean. And Decius believed that the reason Rome was great was because they worshipped the Roman gods. And the reason they had had problems on and off was because they had stopped worshiping the Roman gods. And the thing to do to make Rome great again was force everybody to worship the Roman gods. It was as simple as that. And so quite a nasty persecution under Decius, and then that carried over to Valerian. The great persecution, which I'm going to talk about later on, was under Diocletian and Galerius. Diocletian, Carolyn and I have been to his palace, which is in split Croatia, right, of all places. Diocletian was a great emperor who recognized the first one to admit that one person couldn't run the whole Roman Empire as big as it got. 
So he split it in two. There was a Western Empire with its seat in Rome, and an Eastern Empire with a seat in Byzantium. His, actually, he retired not long after that to his, his compound, his castle, his you know, palace, which is kind of a city in itself, uh, in Croatia, along the Dalmatian coast. But he set up on these two halves of the empire, he put a senior emperor over each one. At first, he was over the Eastern Empire. Um, and then th those were called the, the Augustus, you know, the August ones, the senior emperors. Underneath each of those, there was a Caesar, a junior emperor. His idea was, we'll be able to manage things better that way, plus there won't be everybody trying to kill each other to take over when the guy dies, because there will be a, an established heir, you know, somebody else to take over. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> Right away, three of those four guys, all three but, but Diocletian, started fighting each other to see which of them could take over the whole empire again. <laughs> oh, you guys. <laughs> and so it ended up being nasty. The only good part about it was that one of those four at that time was the father of a man named Constantine. And so this was what led eventually, and we'll talk about that next week, led eventually to the rise of Constantine and the eventual legalization of Christianity as a religion. So all of the mess that happened, and that's called uh, under Diocletian and Galerius. That Galerius was the Caesar underneath Diocletian the Augustus in the Eastern Empire, and Galerius was the one who hated Christians most and caused the most problems. And he eventually convinced Diocletian to pursue a very aggressive uh, persecution of Christians, which became known as the Great Persecution, even though Diocletian's wife and daughter were both Christians. But he convinced them, rather than kill them, and he probably would have, that they should sacrifice to the gods. But they were Christians when this all started. Okay, so that was the, the history of the persecutions up until uh, the Edict of Milan. The Edict of Milan, which was in 311, or 313, excuse me, I had that wrong, under Emperor Constantine. Up until that time, it was technically illegal, although not often persecuted or prosecuted, uh, it was illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was pretty much everywhere. Okay? So there really was no place that you could be comfortable with practicing the Christian faith with no fear of persecution. Now, it, there were very few times in which the persecution was through the whole empire, and there were, there were times in between when there was a break, where they had periods of 30 or 40 or 50 years where there wasn't any of the persecution. But then a new emperor would come along with his own agenda. I want to give you some of the reasons for this, the officially sanctioned persecution. The reasons for persecution, and I break this down by three different groups of people who had reason to persecute Christians. First, there were the Jewish religious leaders. This is the first persecution that we read about in the Acts. As I said earlier, you can kind of understand. They thought these were heretics who were claiming something against God and getting all of these converts. Basically, the Jewish religious leaders saw Christianity as threatening the established religious authority. That's what everybody, all the Pharisees had trouble with Jesus about, and Sadducees too. They also saw Christianity as a Jewish heresy to be stamped out. These people are, are expanding an evil belief that's not true, let's stop it. And finally, there was the potential of a Roman backlash. Because the Romans left the Jews alone as long as things were calm, but the, Jew, the Jews were having so much trouble in so many places with these Christians, there was fear that that would be perceived as being a breakdown of order on the part of the Romans, and they would step in with their military and squash the thing. And the Jews didn't want that, because the Romans were letting them run stuff uh, just fine. The second group of people that had it out for Christians during this time were the non-Jewish Roman citizens, the ordinary people in the street. There are several reasons why they did not like Christians. First of all, Christians were seen as unsociable and usually also perceived as lower class. There may never have been a more class-oriented people in history than the Romans. Yeah. You know, the class that, you know, two-thirds of the people in Rome at the time of Jesus were slaves. You know, there, there was no middle class. You either were slave or, you know, indentured or impoverished, or you were the elite. There was nothing in between. And so, so many of these slaves had become Christians, so many of these lower class people were Christians, that they, this really was partly a class distinction. And they thought these Christians are so low class, and so uneducated, and so ignorant, who could like them? Not only that, they won't do anything sociable. Whenever you went to any social event in the Roman Empire, if it was, well, some of the things that the Christians wouldn't do just simply because of what they were, for instance, they would not go to the arena to watch gladiators kill each other or you know, feed, 
foreigners to the lions or any of that kind of stuff that Romans thought was fun back then. That was inherently contrary to what the Christians thought they ought to be doing. But even if you went to a um, you know the Greek theater that the Romans were holding or a wrestling match or something that was not inherently evil, it always started with a sacrifice to the gods and an acknowledgement of the gods. You know, the same way that we always do the the, uh, <coughs> the national anthem in the United States when you go to a ball game. Back then, they would honor the gods before they started the thing. Christians wouldn't go to social events because they wouldn't do that. If they went to dinner with people who were not Christians, then they would have a libation, a pour out a libation in honor of the gods before they would eat. That was like their grace before the meal. So. Christians develop this reputation of being completely unsociable. They don't want to have anything to do. They've separated themselves from the whole society. Why shouldn't we gang up on them? They're not like us. Let's kill them. As one of my old roommates, Bruce Bowe, used to say, ooh, they're not like us. Let's kill them. <laughs> well, that's very much what the Romans were saying about Christians. Um, there also were rumors of incest and other scandal at the secret Christian love feasts, they called them. These, these uh, agape meals. Oh, scary. Uh, the, part of the incense thing was, well, they were secret. You know, you had to be an initiate. You had to be a Christian in order to participate in these because they often involved serving of communion along with a regular meal, and not anybody could go to that. Well, the, these Christians, sometimes even husband and wife, would refer to each other as brother or sister, you know, because you're my spouse, but you're also my sister, or you're my brother. They... The Romans heard that and thought, these people are incestuous. <laughs> no, they're marrying their brothers and sisters, even though the Roman royalty did that all the time. Yeah. Uh, so incest, uh, other kinds of, they were accused of bestiality, all kinds of weird, kinky stuff must go on at these, these feasts. They also were accused of cannibalism. They heard these people eat the body and blood of their, of their leader at these meetings. <laughs> And they also talked about Jesus as being innocent as a little child. And so this, this, this rumor started that these Christians would get together and they would bring in one of their initiates, the neophytes, the people who didn't know any better. And they would hide the body of an infant in a large loaf of bread and then have the neophyte cut the loaf open and then they would eat the warm oh, flesh of the baby. So, oh, this is what the Christians were accused of. <laughs> wow. uh, already. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I didn't do it, I'm just telling you. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to read it at your house. <laughs> and I've already talked about the fact they were perceived as being atheistic because they didn't worship any visible gods. And it was often thought, this was Decius's big thing, is that if you don't worship the Roman gods, the gods who they believe made Rome great, then you might offend them. And if you offend them, then Rome won't be great anymore. Bad things will happen to us if you don't worship our gods. But the Christians, like the Jews, absolutely refuse. So these are the reasons why they were the, the Christians really were outcasts within Roman society. Partly because they just wouldn't, they wouldn't do what other people wanted you to do. And the third group, which will, and we'll take a break after this, was the uh, per, reason for persecution by the Roman emperors and other Roman authorities. I've already mentioned that Nero blamed the Christians for the fire that burned Rome in 64 AD. Christians were often accused and seen as disturbing unity and public order by refusing to worship traditional gods. Again, you're creating a, a, a rift in a, our whole society by refusing to do the things that are part of our everyday life. You know, you're sitting in, in effect, they would say, you're sitting in judgment against the things that are part of our Roman culture. So you're dividing uh, the culture in two and causing those problems. Um, they refused to worship the emperor after emperor worship was instituted, and that was perceived as treason. One of the reasons that the emperors instituted uh, emperor worship was that if they were <coughs> worshiping the emperor, then they were less likely to rise up against him in a rebellion. And so refusing to do that indicated that maybe you're one of those zealots or one of those guys that's fighting against the Roman Empire. Also, after Christianity broke with Judaism, and again, the final break was in the 130s AD, and that group revolt of Bar Kokhba, then when Christianity was no longer seen as part of Judaism, which Judaism was seen as very weird. They have one God, they won't worship any other gods. But over centuries, the Romans had come to kind of accept it. Because they'd known about it even before they took over Palestine. Judaism had been around a long time. And it was at least an ancient and kind of respectable religion, even though they thought it was pretty weird. Why did you do that? And so they let the Jews get away with stuff. But when Christianity was clearly differentiated from Judaism and was a new thing, 
not ancient, not linked to any religion they could really relate to. They saw it as a superstition, something to be suppressed, not something to be recognized and honored as being a, you know, an ancient and, and respectable religion. And finally, all the same reasons the public hated the Christians. <laughs> the Roman emperors used those as excuses as well. Okay? Any questions about any of that? There's a, there's, a, there's a book that really illustrates these persecutions. That we, everyone here should read that. It's Fox's Book of Martyrs. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's historically accurate. It's, I think it was like the first book ever published. Uh, or printed or something like that. But yeah. it's just absolutely... It's, it's a classic in the Christian church. I mean, required reading in, in a lot of schools and stuff. Fox's Book of Martyrs. Because it talks about all of these different leaders in the church. And some of them even weren't leaders. I could tell you stories about women who, you know, who some of them had been noble women in Rome who refused to get in and, and then were persecuted. Uh, you know, women who were locked well, up only until the babies were born and then they were murdered. Well, like guards, that. guards that guarded Christian leaders were influenced by their, right. the way they accepted death and they decided they wanted to be Christians and die. Yeah, and even Paul, you know, Paul who wrote back, uh, who sends greetings from the household of Rome. Well, that probably means his guards, you know, because they were the Roman, uh, you know, the, the Roman soldiers who were considered of the house of the Roman emperor. And so apparently Paul converted some of his guards. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, two o'clock, let's come back at 10 after 2. So we've just identified a number of the reasons why in the Roman Empire especially, um, Christians were persecuted. They were accused of um, being lower class, and uneducated, and unreasoning. The Romans who were enamored of Greek philosophy particularly, and in some Greek-oriented parts of the world of the Roman Empire, were thought to be um, ignorant. You know, you believe in what, people would say. In fact, there's one piece of graffiti that was found which is a figure with a with a donkey's head hanging on a cross, and there's and this is just graffiti, and there's a figure down below, but it's from the second century. A figure down below with his hands raised, and it says, uh, uh, "Aximachus worships his god," which is an indication that they thought Christianity was just stupid, and you couldn't be sensible and believe in this. Plus all of the accusations of cannibalism, of atheism, you know, you don't worship anything real because there's no, no gods there that you can see, and, and that you, uh, you, you're not loyal to the emperor, and all those kinds of things. Well, in the second century, when Christians were persecuted by Roman authorities for all these many false reasons, a group of intellectual and well-educated Christians, called the Christian Apologists, stepped forward in the second century to defend the church against these charges. Now again, apology does not mean to say you're sorry for something. It means to give an explanation or to give a defense of something. So in the second century, various well-educated and many of them philosophy-oriented um, Christians came forward and started writing these responses, defensive uh, responses to many of the accusations that were being made. Some of them we know very little about. We have just snippets. But some of the names of these people are like Quadratus, Aristopella, uh, Miltiades, Apollinarius of Hierapolis, Melito of Sardis, the again uh, anonymous author of uh, the epistle to uh, Diognetus and Arist Aristides of Athens. One of the most important was Justin Martyr. He, re he received the name Martyr as part of it, as you can imagine, because he was killed. Uh, for being an advocate of Christianity. We also have uh, Tatia of Syria, uh, Athenagoras of Athens, Theophilus of Antioch. These groups, this group of apologists, second century apologists, now it's important to note, the apologists addressed specific kinds of accusations that were being made against Christians. They were not broad-based theologians. They did not write systematic theologies to explain Christianity. They responded to specific accusations. Um, they s were sort of split in two different groups in terms of their writings. There were some of them, Tatian of Syria being one of the most uh, polemical, who believed that the whole orientation toward philosophy was completely wrong. 
All right. If you're if you try to if you're playing in the wrong in the wrong field, if you try to use philosophy to explain Christianity. But then others of them, like Justin Martyr, for instance, is a really good example, were philosophers before they became Christians. And they saw much in Plato and Socrates, especially, for instance, Platonic philosophy was very popular at this time. They saw much in Platonic philosophy that they believed was absolutely consistent with Christianity. And so they argued for the truth of Christianity from some of the popular philosophies of their day. And again, even though we're talking about the Roman Empire, it was the Greek philosophies that were dominant in that day and the ones that were really popular. Most of these guys wrote in Greek. Again, yeah, Greek was the international language at that point. That's why the New Testament was written in Greek. There are some exceptions. As we get further along, um, Tertullian, for, in for instance, who was a, sort of a broader theologian, but also an apologist, he wrote a, wrote a document called, interestingly, The Apology, in which he presents a philosophical argument for uh, Christianity. He wrote in Latin. So, in fact, Tertullian is called the father of Western Christianity because he was the first significant one who wrote in Latin instead of in Greek. Latin, of course, being the language of the Roman Empire. Everybody knew Greek before the Romans took over, so they kept talking Greek. But over a period of time, Latin took over and became more common because it was the governmental language and then ultimately dominant because of that. Yes, John? Question. Uh, Justin Martyr, did, did, did he, like provide uh, uh, an apology that, uh, a defense that actually stopped one of those persecutions we just studied? Uh, was it he or Tertullian or, or somebody? Seems to me I remember it was, it was, it was Justin Martyr that gave a defense and his defense to that particular emperor pretty much put the brakes on. Well, I don't think it was Justin Martyr because he was martyr. <laughs> so he was not successful in stopping meeting. Now, Tertullian, almost a hundred years after Trajan's response to Pliny the Younger, Tertullian was a lawyer. I mean, he was a that Roman lawyer. Been, been. He actually wrote a sort of um, judicial response yeah. because Trajan's, law, Trajan's edict that said, "Don't actively persecute, right. don't actively, actively go against or go after the Christians." But if one of them shows up, you have to. Well, Trajan, or I'm sorry, Tertullian gave a lawyer's response to that in which he argued from a legal point of view how ridiculous that was. You're saying it's not illegal enough to go and find the people, but it's illegal enough to kill them if somebody else turns them in. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's what I was thinking about. Yeah, but that, that actually was 100 years after Trajan's uh, comments, but it was still the general policy that people followed. I mean, after Trajan, all the way to Constantine, there were various emperors who had their own edicts, like Severus had an edict, and Decius had an edict, but failing that, whatever else was happening, you all, they could always fall back on the fact that Trajan had made it illegal early on. But Tertullian's, uh, his response, I mean, he, that really weighed heavy on yeah, those officials. because it was a very legal response. And these writers, um, bless you, the, the extant materials, and as I say, some of them, like Quadratus and Aristo of Pello, we have very little, just, just they're quoted elsewhere, it's basically what it is. Um, and yet what they have is very sharp stuff. And so one of the big accusations is, you'd have to be an idiot to believe this stuff. Well, these guys come along, like Justin, who was brilliant, and they're writing um, high-level philosophy. And some of it is, you know, like Lactation and others insisted that we could not get speculative. In philosophy, speculation means to take principles that are agreed upon and to sort of take them to the next intellectual level. Well, Justin Martyr did exactly that. He took the philosophies of the day and he <coughs> speculated to the next level. So the very high-level intellectual Greek philosophers were going, whoa, this guy's good. And it was almost as much because he was perceived as a threat that he was martyred as anything else. Okay, But these apologists were the ones that sort of finally put the skids on many of the accusations. Now, it was fairly easy. It was not a huge deal to prove that we're not really cannibals. You know, we don't cut up babies and eat them. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not practicing incest. Those things were pretty, pretty straightforward. But one of, the, one of the reasons why that happened, one of the things that Justin did, for instance, is he wrote long explanations of what Christian worship was. And some of our understanding of what Christian worship was like in the second century 
is because of what the Christian apologists wrote in order to explain Christian worship, what actually happened and why it happened and what it meant in response to the accusations being made against Christianity. That's a, that's a lot of the record we have of how they were worshiping 100 years after the time of Jesus. Okay. So, very valuable to us from a historical, from an ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical point of view, for us to have these early apologists. And again, uh, just as with the, the Apostolic Fathers, a number of the apologists were themselves martyred um, because of their defense of the faith. Um, and in, in one case, for instance, there was... Um, I think it was Justin who was on trial. Three other Roman lawyers or people with law background came forward to defend him. And in the course of their defending him, they were questioned and it was determined they were Christians and they were martyred as well. Okay. It was a rough time to be a believer uh, back then. So some of, some of the things they argued, for instance, was the idea that the, you had to worship the emperor in order to be loyal. And, they argued very logically that what the worship, well, what the emperor wants and needs isn't worship, it's service. And we're as committed to serving the emperor as anybody. Give us a chance to show it to you. you know, indicate to us at any point where you can identify Christians who actually have done anything against the emperor, even though you accuse us of that. Uh, and so some of this was simply very reasoned argument against some of the accusations to make it clear that they were not reasonable accusations at all. Okay. Um, from the address to uh, Diognetus, here's a quote about Christians. Again, much of this was explaining who we really are. Christians are no different from the rest in their nationality, language, or customs. They live in their own countries, but as sojourners. They fulfill all their duties as citizens, but they suffer as foreigners. They find their homeland wherever they are, but their homeland is not in any one place. They are in the flesh, but do not live according to the flesh. They live on earth, but are citizens of heaven. They obey all the laws, but they live at a level higher than that required by law. They love all, but all persecute them. That was true to me? No, that's uh, actually, we don't know the author. It was from the address to Diognetus. It's believed that Quadratus might have been the author of the Epistle to Diognetus. Um, that's the one in the middle here. Author of, uh, uh, there's one text that seemed to indicate that Quadratus was the author of that, but we don't know for sure. But again, in that, you just get this sort of appeal to reason and to compassion and to sensibility. We're just like you. You know, we don't have horns in the tail. Why are you treating us like this? As well as being philosophical as well as being you know political in terms of explaining the political realities of why it's a really bad idea to persecute one group of people just because of what they believe um, and so the apologists were very very influential in that regard okay now I want to talk about some of the heresies of the second century uh, let's kind of make stuff here I mean, because I'm kind of just all right here we go Really dry today. It's just me or is it just really dry? Okay, heresy can be defined as a formal denial or a doubt of a core doctrine of the Christian church. In the case of Christian heresy, you could apply that to any other belief system. You know, a formal denial or doubt of a core doctrine. But in the second century, again, we're talking about a hundred years after Jesus, not very long in the scope of things. By the second century, before there had not yet been established a clear New Testament canon, we didn't have a clearly defined 27 books that we can look to for instruction. All the writings existed by then, but they weren't all gathered together in one place, and there was some question about some of them, etc. Nor had there been a clear articulation and defense of the larger Christian doctrines. Okay? We didn't have uh, Bart's systematic theology to go back and look at, all right? He's one of the easy ones, trust me. Um, so what, we had a lot of problems with people coming along with wrong ideas, people doubting tenets of the, of the faith, so that the church had to respond to that. They had to say, wait a minute, that does not sound right. Now, let me think about why that's not right, based upon what we do believe and what we do know and what the apostles taught us and what we have in writings, 
and to respond to it. And I want to give you a few of those primary heresies. One of them that I mentioned already is um, Ebionism. Ebionism is the same thing that Paul is writing against in the book of Galatians, for instance. And that is Jewish Christians who insisted that Gentile Christians had to become circumcised and obey the Mosaic Law. They are referred to, in many cases, as Judaizers. Ebionites is the more theological, or his, you know, historical theology term for them. So they were Jewish Christians who, who believed in Jesus, but they said in order to be saved, you have to not only believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised if you're a Gentile and obey all the dietary laws and everything else. That was deemed to be a heresy. In fact, if you want to read about the declaration that that was not accurate, then go to, to the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, the Jerusalem Council, because they dealt with that issue in the book of Acts. The Jerusalem Council determined that God had demonstrated his love for the Gentiles, even though they weren't circumcised, even though they weren't Jewish heritage, and so therefore they did not have to obey all the laws. Okay? So that was one of the first ones, and that was linked to some of the early persecution, or, or even, you might even say some of the early confusion between Jews and Christians that led to persecution and to confusion about what this new uh, belief is. The second, and one of the big ones, is Gnosticism. Gnosticism was more of a philosophy than a religion, but at a certain point they did the same thing. It was a dualistic belief that the material world should be shunned and that the spiritual world should be embraced and that acquiring gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which is the Greek word for mystical knowledge. It means knowledge, but it's more than just knowing facts. It's not like arithmetic knowledge. It's mystical knowledge. That the acquiring of gnosis is the key to spiritual development. Now, this was a tough one for Christians because it's this was the New Age movement of 2,000 years ago. In fact, the New Age movement is not a New Age movement, it's an Old Age movement. It's, it's, it's Gnosticism, which has never completely gone away. And like new, the New Age movement, it's no one thing. It's like this giant amorphous jellyfish and you can't nail it down. You know, you squeeze it in one place and it pops out somewhere else. Because of the fact that it was so um, non-specific in its beliefs, but some of the things it did believe, and has always believed, and I should say this too, early on, the only thing we knew about Gnosticism for centuries was what the people who were against it had written against it. We didn't have any of the documents that told us what Gnosticism actually said for themselves until 1945. And in 1945, there was a large collection of Gnostic writing discovered in the Nag Hammadi in Egypt. And they're now called the Nag Hammadi Library. The Nag Hammadi collection were the actual Gnostic writings. That was the Gnostics writing for themselves, not somebody arguing why they were wrong, which is all we had before. Um, it was in the Nag Hammadi library that we found the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Truth, which was written by Valentinus, who was one of the great Gnostic advocates in the second century, and a number of other things, the Gospel of Judas, um, the, the, etc. I could go on a long list of them because there are a lot of these pieces. But you can actually get in, I think I've hidden it so nobody can pick it up accidentally, back in the office here, is the Gnostic Gospels, you know, which Elaine Pagels and some other people advocate that they should be part of Scripture. But in my mind, anybody with their head screwed on halfway straight reads for five minutes, and you can tell this is not the same stuff as what we have in, in Scripture, all right? It just does not click. Um, that's my own editorial view of the thing. You can make your own decision. Um, it's a great... Uh, for the Gnostics, again, knowledge was the key. Because they believed that the physical world was at worst evil, at best unreal, it's a very Eastern religion kind of thing, you know, that the world is not real or it's perhaps evil. They believed that creation, the supreme being, did not create all of creation. The supreme being had an emanation called an eon, which was sort of a, you know, sh shuffle off a, another being, which then shuffled off another eon, which shuffled off another eon, on down the line. And eventually, they ended up with these spiritual beings, eons, and they got one that was so far away from the original supreme being, they messed up and actually made a physical world. Okay. And the Gnostics actually related, uh, described the, the creation of the physical world as an abortion. You know, it was a, it was a mistake. It was a terrible thing. And so the whole point is the supreme being could not be uh, attributed with having created the physical world because the physical world is a bad thing. 
And so the only way that to, the way we have to deal with this is we have to try to figure out how to get out of the imprisonment of the physical world and become fully spiritual again. The only way to become fully spiritual again is to, is to gain the mystical knowledge. So to gain the mystical knowledge, somebody has to teach us. And the Supreme Being, so frustrated that one of his down-the-line uh, emanations, created the world, sent us a teacher to teach us the right knowledge. And that teacher's name was Jesus. Jesus was not divine. He was a creative being sent by the Supreme Being to teach us the secret knowledge to help us shuffle off this mortal coil, so to speak. Um, and so you end up with a lot of screwy things. For instance, since Jesus was sent by the spiritual supreme being to help us get out of the physical world, then Jesus couldn't actually be physical. He only looked physical so we could relate to him and listen to him. He appeared to be human, but he wasn't. He was just spirit. This idea of Gnosticism <laughs> is called docetism. And docetism took many different forms. Gnosticism being one of them. Uh, docetism means to appear as. Um, so Jesus appeared as a human, but he wasn't really. He was a spiritual being. So they denied the incarnation. They denied the idea of sin. You can't really sin if everything in the physical world is evil. Then where do you go from there? So Jesus didn't come to save us from our sins. He just came, as, came to give us this mystical knowledge we need to be real. And so... It wasn't Christianity, but it purported to be Christianity. And a lot of people bought into it, just like a lot of people buy into New Age things today and think that they're being Christian, because Christian has lost its meaning to a lot of people. So Gnosticism became a huge challenge in the second century, and then on from there. Now, there was an incipient or a beginning Gnosticism uh, earlier, which Paul addresses. Paul speaks to the Gnostic heresy. And in fact, I'm inclined to disagree with scholars who say Gnosticism didn't really exist till the 2nd century, but there was some early precursor to it that Paul addressed. You look at what Paul says, and it's exactly the stuff that Gnosticism actually said in the 2nd century, we know because of the Nicomani Library, and I'm thinking, then why don't we just call that Gnosticism? Since it's saying the same things, and it was, we know it existed then, because Paul addresses it in letters that he wrote in the 60s and 70s AD, so I believe that it's actually older than most people credit. But scholars do at least admit that there was a, you know, a, as I say, an incipia, that sort of uh, flo free-floating kind of Gnostic ideas that existed in Paul's time. Okay. Questions about that? That's a big one, and especially because it never has really gone away. Was that, that dos, what would you call it? Dos Docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Wasn't that um, challenged, like in that first, Council? I mean, I mean, it was... Oh, it was challenged even before the first council. In fact, you know what? Uh, think about the creeds. The belief that, that the supreme being did not make the created world. How does the creed start? Either one of them. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So, the creeds were written as much to oppose Gnostic beliefs as to declare what we believe. And so some of these heresies that existed back then were critical to us finally articulating what we believe. And so many of these false beliefs, also about the nature of Jesus, it talks about, you know, and Jesus Christ is only Son, our Lord, our, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary. The Gnostics said Jesus wasn't born of Mary because that would mean he had a physical body, and he didn't have a physical body, so somebody, that's not true. That's why we put it in the creed, is to say you're wrong. Right. Uh, I missed the definition of docetism. Docetism means literally to appear as. And it meant that Jesus was not really physical in a physical body. He only appeared to be in a physical body. He was like a ghost that you looked at and you thought it was a real person. That, that ended up, docetism, again, that's kind of a general topic of things because that, that idea appeared a bunch of different places. Okay. Uh, in fact... It's kind of strange for us today to realize that some of the earliest heresies did not deny the divinity of Jesus, which is what people do today. Right? Today, most heresies are denying the divinity of Jesus. Back then, they denied the humanity of Jesus more often than not. They accepted that he was in somehow divine, that he, was, he, was, he came from the supreme being, as the Gnostics would say, but that he wasn't actually physical, that he didn't have a human body. So, you know, the devil has convinced us in all kinds of directions how to try to deny the truth. Okay, 
So, that docetism occurs, and again, the docetism, docetism literally means, it's a Greek for to seem like. Um, and the, the Gnostics went so far as to say that, that, you know, we are spirits and we're trying to be released from our spirits, but there's some people who don't really have spirits. They're entirely carnal, they're like animals. So they got to pick and choose. Do you have a slip for the docetism? That no, I don't. Because by itself, it was not a heresy. It was an aspect of other things. And what's the spelling of it? D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, docetism. Okay, now the third one I want to mention to you, uh, which was not a major issue, but it was there, is incretism, which is, you might also call that asceticism, meaning self-denial. Um, Incretism, if I remember correctly, is uh, the Greek means to be by ourselves. <laughs> you know, because they advocated extreme ascetic practices, meaning they did not believe in marriage, they believed in complete celibacy, they did not believe you should eat any meat or drink any wine, you know, very simple foods, and because Paul specifically writes against all that stuff, they didn't like Paul, so they rejected all of Paul's epistles. In fact, if you read 1 Timothy 4, and I will actually do that, because I have my Bible right here. Um, this is why I'm having trouble. <laughs> I'm looking at this thinking, I think I know scripture better than that, and something's wrong, but well, my tabs are upside down. <laughs> okay, 1 Timothy 4, the first four verses. Apparently, Paul was writing against the incretists or the asceticists. The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars, what do you really think, Paul? Whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Okay? He was specifically addressing that heresy in, in uh, 1 Timothy. It was not a huge heresy because complete celibacy and not being able to eat meat or drink wine was not very popular. So not a lot of people bought it too. Um, but you get the idea, okay? Now, um, keep going here. The two biggest of these, and I put one on each page, were Gnosticism and this next one, which is, oh, sorry, Marcionism. Marcion was the uh, son of the Bishop of Sinope on the southern coast of the Black Sea. So he grew up in the church. However, he decided early in his life that he profoundly disliked Judaism and he profoundly disliked the physical world. So in 144 AD, Marcion goes to Rome and starts teaching his own set of beliefs, which in fairly short order the church in Rome decides is not what Christianity is all. So Marcion starts his own churches. The Marcionite churches ended up being the dominant churches in whole regions of the ancient Near East, and in fact, <coughs> continued for several centuries, long after Marcion's death. And as I said here, it's perhaps the greatest threat ever, it's, it's considered by many, to be the greatest threat ever to the Christian church. Basically, Marcionism was, was, was a kind of Gnosticism. They were related to each other. It was a dualistic belief system, and again, he did not like the physical world. It claimed that Jesus was the Savior, but it also was uh, docetistic, meaning it believed that Jesus was not in a physical body, really, but only appeared to be. Particularly, Marcion rejected the entire Old Testament and everything Jewish about the New Testament. In fact, he went so far as to say the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, was a different God than the God of the New Testament. That the God of the Old Testament who created the world, because the world is bad, the physical world is bad, he was a bad God. He was not the same as the loving, blessing, merciful God of the New Testament who had sent us Jesus, the Spirit, in order to bring us to a right understanding. Marcion, one of the things about Marcion that was, was most particular is that he started collecting all of the different Christian writings um, that had occurred since the Apostles' Day. 
He gathered them together in one place, and it's almost as though nobody thought to do this before the middle of the second century. But he collected all of the writings he could of the gospel writers, and of Paul, and of all these other people, and he decided that only the epistles of Paul and the gospel of Luke, heavily edited, he went in and changed a lot, he took out anything, that, he liked Luke because it was Gentile, not Jewish, he took out any Jewish references and anything that seemed miraculous. That's the good parts. Um, and so he created the Marcionite canon, meaning he had his own New Testament. You'll notice this is before there was a New Testament other than that. So, most of, not all, but most of the epistles of Paul and the Gospel of Luke, heavily edited, were Marcionites. And this is one of the reasons I believe Marcion was so successful. Cults down through the years, the ones that have lasted, have been the ones that have a book. Mormonism? You know, you can go on. The ones that have writings, Christian science, the writings of, you know, uh, Mary, what's her name? Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy, you know, etc. They have their own writings, that ties people together, brings people in, gives them a common sense of purpose, even if it's wrong. Well, Marcion did the same thing, heavily edited Luke, some of the epistles, and he, he developed a full-blown theology. He was a smart guy, as wrong as he was. And so he developed this systematic theology based upon his anti-material world, docetistic, anti-Judaism, -Ju anti-Old Testament kind of views. And he developed it as such a good theology that a lot of people bought into it because there was not a well-developed theology of, of the Christian faith in place before that. Okay? Um, fascinating stuff. Wrong in so many ways. All right? Now, then we have the, the last of the, of the heresies, and there were a lot of, you know, little heresies. There were little brush fires everywhere. Because, again, there wasn't a, there wasn't a biblical canon. And there was not a clearly articulated theology of Orthodox Christianity. When I say Orthodox, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox. Orthodox means right belief, you know, the standard belief of the faith. The, the, the last of the heresies I'm going to talk about is Montanism. Uh, it was also called the New Prophetic Movement. Uh, it's called Montanism because it was founded by uh, Montanus and his two female acolytes, Priscilla and uh, Maximilla. This was a prophetic movement that claimed that they had experienced, or were experiencing, a new, direct, and ecstatic revelation from the Holy Spirit. That wouldn't probably have been a problem. It sounds very much like the charismatic movement and renewal of today. Except, Montanus and his followers declared that that new revelation from the Holy Spirit directly to and through them superseded everything before it, including Jesus. That they were getting new revelations that, that superseded the apostles, Paul, all the others, and even was more important and more relevant than Jesus. Now remember, in the second century, the Christians were still believing that they were in the last era. That this is the, 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 the age of the church, and Jesus could come back any day, certainly by next Thursday. And that this was the, the last era of the church. Montanus and his followers were saying, oh, no, 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 we're the new era. We're the last era of the church. You guys are so last week. <laughs> and so the church had to look at this and say, you can't supersede Jesus. You can't claim that your prophetic, ecstatic utterances from the Holy Spirit are more important than the apostolic writings. You can't do that. Okay. Um, and so Montanism was declared to be a heresy. In one of those weird twists of history, Tertullian, who was one of the great apologists, one of the great teachers of the church, who did more probably to argue against the criticisms and for the faith of almost anybody with this sharp Latin lawyer mind, he became a Montanist toward the end of his life. And even after he joined the cult, something that had been declared a cult by the church, he still wrote against heresies. So, figure it out, you know? Um, 
So one of the things that you, you get a picture of here, and I mentioned it when I started, is you've got these uh, persecutions. Then the apologists come along specifically to address those accusations that led to the persecutions, right? They address the specific points. Then you have, in the mid and late second century, you have these heresies that come along. Some of them, Gnosticism was fairly loose, but still very convoluted. There's a lot to it. And Marcion, who not only, he was the first one to have a Bible, in the, a New Testament Bible, even though he was wacky about it. Um, and he was the first one to have a very well thought out and articulated and written down theology. Well, we could, the church decided we can't just deal with one-off kind of problems. We can't put out these little fires as they come up because Marcion has set fire to the whole forest. <laughs> no, we need to have a large response. And so it was at that point that we get a large response, and that is through the Christian theologians or the teachers of the early church. Whereas the apostolic fathers have for the most part addressed specific theological questions that had come up, and the apologists had responded to accusations against the church by Roman authorities. More comprehensive heresies in the second century, like Marcionism, demanded a more complete exposition of what it meant to be a Christian. What is our whole belief system? A systematic theology, to use words that were invented later on, so that we explain it all in one swell food, in terms of everything we believe. Okay? There were a number of Christian teachers or theologians at that point. Of, the, of them, some of the most important were Irenaeus of Lyon, Clement of Alexandria, and God bless his heart, Tertullian of Carthage, Again, from North Africa, but Latin-speaking Carthage has been conquered by Rome a long time before. And origin of Alexandria. I'm going to talk about those for just a couple of minutes. Um, Irenaeus had been a um, native of probably Smyrna in Asia Minor, city on the coast of Asia Minor, not too far from Ephesus. Um, today called Izmir. You can visit there. I can recommend a really good hotel to you. <laughs> Now, in, he was probably born around 130, so his life was the middle and the end of the second century. Pretty much everything we're talking about today is second century, just so you know. That's the post-apostolic period, or the period of the apostolic fathers. And by the way, I didn't say this. When you study the apostolic fathers, or any of the fathers, meaning the early Christian leaders after the apostles, that's called patristic theology, as in pater, father. So patristic theology is the study of the writings of the early church fathers. So, um, for reasons that we don't know, somehow Irenaeus got from Smyrna in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, to Lyon, France. And Lyon was one of the areas that part of the Roman Empire, you know, the Gauls, uh, the, the French, that was one of the areas that suffered very badly under the persecutions. And uh, Irenaeus did end up becoming a martyr in 2002, just at the start of the third century. Okay, he was martyred in Lyon because apparently the Roman governor in Lyon took his orders very seriously when it came to persecuting Christians. But in the process, um, we get from uh, Irenaeus a very good picture of what the faith of the church was like in the second century. I say that because Irenaeus was mostly a pastor. And so most of what he wrote, and he wrote a lot that is passed down to us, relatively speaking. I mean, we have others like Quadratus that we only have a few quotes of him and something else. But we know of him as being a leader in the, of the apologist. But Irenaeus wrote as a pastor. He talked a lot about how, what he taught his flock and what his flock needed to know. Particularly, he focused on the incarnate word who was Jesus Christ. And in doing so in basically writing these letters of instruction, some of which were written after he was arrested and taken away, in writing these letters of teaching to his flock, he ended up with quite a comprehensive theology of the Christian faith, one of the earliest ones we have, which didn't just deal with isolated issues or problems, but really presented the way he would present to his body of uh, congregation what the Christian faith was about and what it meant to be a believer. And so uh, he dealt with redemption and the nature of Jesus in finding uh, us redeemed. And he particularly was focused on the presence of God in history, how God has acted in history, in the incarnation, uh, how God's divine purposes have unfolded throughout all of history, and how God uses a historical context 
for his instruction and blessing to us. And in doing so, he gave, uh, he sort of connected this Christian theology with the history of people in a way that it became quite a comprehensive uh, exposition of what it meant to be a Christian. A second person in a very different place, Clement of Alexandria. We believe that Clement was born in Athens, ended up in Alexandria, which was one of the great academic centers of the Roman world. Alexandria, of course, in Egypt. Um, there, he, he, as a young man, his parents had been pagans, and apparently as a young man, Clement really struggled and really searched. In fact, he traveled the world trying to find somebody who could help him understand what life was for. In Alexandria, he found a teacher that we know almost nothing about except his name. He was called Pentanus, and he taught Clement, converted him to Christianity, and Clement, being a very bright young man, started writing and teaching and continued to do so until he, too, was martyred in the early 200s under the persecution of Septimus Severus. Um, but in the meantime, before he was actually martyred, he left Alexandria, traveled throughout the Eastern Mediterranean Basin, writing letters and teaching and uh, discipling people all along the way for quite a long time. So again, we end up with Clement, who had been from Alexandria originally, traveling, influencing a lot of people, and creating a very focused theology. Now, whereas Irenaeus had been a pastor and was writing in a way like he was teaching his flock, um, Clement, which would, is what you would expect from somebody who really grew up intellectually in Alexandria, he was not a pastor, he was a philosopher, he was a thinker, he was a searcher. And so when he became a Christian, his goal was to expound the faith of the church, but to do so in the context, as, as some of the others, like Justin did the same thing, Justin Martyr, but to do it in the context of what does it mean to be a thinking person in the philosophies of the world, and to take the truth of Platonism and the truth of the Socratic method and all of these others and to think of them in terms of the great truth, which is Christianity. And so, whereas um, Irenaeus of Lyon presented a pastoral approach to a systematic theology, Clement of Alexandria presented a philosophical theology, which addressed the same truths, but from a different direction, so that it gave us a, another dimension to what the Christian faith was all about. In fact, um, Clement went so far as to say that whereas God had spoken to the Jews by establishing his covenant of law, God had, God had spoken to the Greeks by giving them philosophy. And that our job as Christians now was to understand that both of those were our precursors. Both of them gifts from God, and how did they work together? Okay. Um, We then have Tertullian of Carthage. As I mentioned to you, he was the first Latin writer and teacher of the church, and therefore is considered really the father of Western Christianity. Western meaning Latin, based in Rome, Western, whereas Greek, based in Byzantium, or Antioch, or Alexandria, very Greek-oriented in the East. Most of the early thinking of the church, because it started in Palestine, in the ancient Near East, Asia Minor, Middle East, uh, North Africa was where the earliest writings, all in Greek, occurred. Now things start shifting west, and Tertullian was the first great thinker and writer of the Christian faith. He wrote a number of treatises in defense of the faith, the faith against pagans and against various kinds of heresies. In that regard, Tertullian almost, he's the only character really, Justin, Justin Martyr a little bit, but Tertullian more so, bridges the gap between being an apologist on the one hand, you know, because he did address specific issues and accusations and even heresies. And then on the other hand, being a broader teacher, because he wrote, he wrote some of the most significant kinds of uh, general testimonies to what the faith is all about. Um, he, took a, he had a very legal-oriented legal mind, and so a very piercing kind of thought. Um, you'll, if you study Christian history at all, or Christian theology at all, you'll come across a lot of Tertullian quotes because he was, you know, a very sharp kind of legal mind, and so he was always coming up with these aphorisms, these one-liners that kind of cut through stuff, because that's the way he thought. He was a rhetorician as well as being a thinker. Um, now, Tertullian was not, he was on the opposite side from Justin Martyr or, or Irenaeus, who would, or I'm sorry, Clement of Alexandria, who believed in philosophy and believed in speculation, 
Tertullian was more along the line of Tatian, who said, no, let's not get sucked into this idea of um, philosophy being at the core of the Christian faith. Let's not do philosophical speculation. Again, there's that very rigid kind of legalistic mindset. Um, and one of his students, one of Tertullian's students, Cyprian, who comes up later in the history of the church, Cyprian was the one who said, um, what does Rome have with Jerusalem? You know, what does, what does, I'm sorry, what does Athens have with Jerusalem? What does philosophy have to do with the faith? Okay, they saw them as separate. But again, God used these different people and the different approaches to fill in different dimensions so that the faith could relate to different people. Unfortunately, as I told you, uh, Tertullian became a Montanist late in his life. Even after he began to follow Montanism, he still was writing apologies against various kinds of heresies and never seemed to quite get that he was... He, he are one of them, okay? Um, so who knows? And the last one I want to talk about for a couple of minutes is Origen of Alexandria. Origen was a student of Clement of Alexandria, and he was the last of the four great teachers that, that we would consider, probably the last of the four of the greatest teachers. He um, had been entrusted as the teacher of catechumens when he was still a teenager by the bishop of Alexandria, Demetrius. And so he began very early on, because he was teaching new believers what it means to be a Christian, he began to articulate, while he was still in his teens, what it meant to believe in Jesus. And so, because he lived, you know, for quite a long while, um, lived until he was about 70 years old, and he started doing this when he was a teenager, he, and he was a brilliant mind. There are stories about Origen dictating seven different documents to seven different secretaries simultaneously. Um, he was brilliant. In fact, he was so brilliant. Later on, I mentioned that the Bishop Demetrius of Alexandria had named him in charge of catechumens when he was a teenager. Later, a few years later, they had a huge falling out, and almost everybody attributes it to the fact that Demetrius got jealous. You know, it was sort of a Saul and David kind of thing. Um, and the sense was that this man was, origin was truly great. He was an astonishing thinker, very committed to the faith. Um, but unlike Tertullian, but like his teacher Clement, Origen believed in taking philosophy and using it and, and doing philosophical speculation. In fact, some of the stuff that he, he purported, I mean, he had a lot of wonderful things, but some scholars have looked at that and said, you know, Origen was more Platonic than he was Christian. He was more of a, a Platonic philosopher than he really was a Christian theologian. But he was very, very influential in presenting a defense of the faith. Okay? One more topic we're going to address, and that is the development of the canon of Scripture. The biblical canon, and again, canon comes from a Greek word, kanon, which means a yardstick. So it, it is the yardstick that God has given us to measure our lives against. It is the instruction that we have, the rule for our lives. So the biblical canon is the set of books that Christians, and Jews also for the Old Testament canon, that Christians have determined to be divinely inspired and thus rightly included as part of the Christian Bible. Which books were written not, not just by men for interesting stuff, but actually were given by God, that the Holy Spirit inspired them. Now, I mentioned already the influence that Marcion had on creating our New Testament. Marcion was the first one who gathered New Testament writings and settled on what he thought should be the canon. And that was a very powerful tool that he was using, and the rest of the Christians said, we better get, up, get on the stick here, work this thing out, and figure out, you know, we don't agree with what Marcion's doing, but we better have our own version of this. So in a very weird way, a heretic was responsible for us being, us being the church, getting pushed to the point where we had to decide what is God's divine word for us in the New Testament. We already had accepted the Old Testament as being canon. Well, what is the New Testament canon? One of the oldest documents that we have that refer to a listing of New Testament books is called the Moratorian Fragment. Uh, the guy who found it was an archaeologist whose last name was Moratorius. It was written around 170 A.D. or a little before that, so we're still well in the second century. Um, and this is the oldest list we have. It's very similar to our current 27-book New Testament, with the exception that it does not include Hebrews, James, or 2 Peter. Those are some of the books that have always been kind of questioned. Um, in fact, throughout the history of the development of canon, they sort of, they've been included sometimes, not included sometimes. And so there's always been kind of a question. Hebrews, because we don't know who the writer is. James, because on the surface it looks like it, it, it disagrees with Paul. 
And Paul is always, the Gospels, the four Gospels, from the very earliest indication, all four of the Gospels have been accepted as part of the canon. That's never been challenged, really. Um, Paul sort of comes next in authority. And so James, on the surface, and I don't believe it really does, but on the surface it looks like it might be disagreeing with Paul, and so they weren't sure about that. Second Peter, the authorship was questioned in terms of did he write it. Now, um, then Origen of Alexandria in the early 200s used the same 27 books that we have in our New Testament. Although he still acknowledged there were some people who disputed Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, those little tiny letters, and the book of Revelation. Revelation has always been kind of the periphery. Even if people put it in there, they still had a question mark by it. Because, let's face it, revelations can seem kind of weird sometimes. Um, and then, Athanasius of Alexandria in 367 absolutely affirmed this was the list of books that we have in the New Testament, and he declared them canonized. There were several councils of the church in the 300s that, and the early 400s that affirmed this, including um, some that were monitored and overseen by Augustine of Hippo, who we'll talk about later on. Um, and then, um, well, let me talk about that in a second. I want to say one other thing about this. How many of you have read The Da Vinci Code? Shame on you. No, I'm just no. kidding. <laughs> I read it. I'm just teasing. <laughs> My daughter gave me that as a present, but she also gave me a book disputing all Oh, there you go. <laughs> Both ends of it. Well, in the Da Vinci Code and some of Dan Brown's other writings, and he always in the introduction says, this is all historically accurate. This is really true. It's not. Okay. For instance, and I've, got, I've given you some dates up here, one of the things that people claim, and Gnostic, the people who defend Gnostic Gospels, like Elaine Pagel's claim, and Dan Brown says, is that the reason why we have the New Testament we have is because Constantine, for political reasons, decided that he was going to settle all the arguments, and he picked those books and put them in there, and there's no theological or religious reason why we shouldn't also include the Gospel of Thomas or, you know, various others of the Gnostic writings. Well, all you get is read them, and nothing going to lie. Um, the fact is that by the middle of the second century, now, Dan Brown says it happened at the, the Council of Nicaea, which was in 326, you know, a quarter of the way through the fourth century. We have documentation that the Bible and the New Testament as we know it was pretty much settled two and a half centuries before that. Is that two and a half centuries? Yeah. Yeah. Fifteen. Well, two and three quarters. A uh, century and three quarters. Almost two centuries before that. <laughs> Can you make math after lecturing for two hours? So, that's wrong. The church had already decided informally amongst themselves what God's ordained writing to us was supposed to be. And we have that. We have documents of that as early as 170. And it was actually, you know, the Gospels were settled long before that. And that's one of the things Brown says is that the Gospels were just, they just decided so, don't believe that. All right? We have evidence that... Now, you will notice that 170 is 25 years after Marcion made his big thing. Because Marcion really pushed us to start deciding that. that song. Then, I want to mention in, in two minutes, the development of the first priest in apostolic succession. I mentioned to you earlier that why apostolic succession? The idea was, since you had people come along who were heretics, the best way to not have heresy is to make sure that the people who were leaders in the church were trained by people who were trained by people who were the apostles. And that way they'll get the right teaching. Uh, that's why apostolic succession happened. It's also true that when you had all of these heresies and people were being called on to renounce Jesus and to, to uh, sacrifice to the gods, when people, some people did, or some people sort of walked the middle line negatively, and they would go out and they would just buy one of these certificates that said they had sacrificed to the gods, but they didn't. And then there were others, bless you, called confessors, who actually suffered for Christ, who weren't martyred, but were still alive, but still had been tormented or tortured or threatened, and they were called the confessors, the one that didn't deny the faith. Well, later on, they had to decide when the church was legal again, how do we deal with those people who renounce the faith? Because we have people who suffer greatly and didn't renounce the faith. Is everybody just the same now? 
And that's one of the reasons why struggling with how to deal with that, how do you bring somebody back into the fellowship when they've committed sins, sin of, of denial of the faith? That's why the church early on developed these rites of penance, a process to go through to demonstrate that you cleaned up your act and you know you, you admit that you made a mistake, etc. Well, penance was one of the big things that the, the Reformation had trouble with. And yet there was a very real historical reason why that stuff was instituted. is to deal with real problems of how do we how do we, you know how do we fix this thing. And then the first creeds I already mentioned that some of the early heresies, especially the Gnostic heresies and those related to it, like the fact that God didn't create the world. The world is an abortion by a minor demiurge somewhere down the line. And scripture also in one place talks about piling up genealogies. Remember that? All the people piling up genealogies? That was the Gnostics. Because they actually try to track the different emanations. And they identified as many as 365 different emanations from the Supreme Being before they got to the one who messed up and made the world. So a lot of the creeds, the particulars within the creeds, starting with, um, I, I read to you from First Clement, which indicates uh, an early form, at least phrases that were in the Apostles' Creed. Early on, they came up with a statement called the Old Roman Form which was the basis from which the Apostles' Creed was developed, and so it has elements from First Clement. And those creeds were supposed to be, all right, let's, you know, here, in the next four minutes, you have an opportunity to declare what you believe to show that you don't agree with Marcion, or the Gnostics, or the Ebionites, or, you know, whatever. So the creeds were a shorthand version of saying, this is what we believe as opposed to those heresies. And that's why the creeds are so important. Now, I've had people challenge me. A guy said to me one time, why, don't you, why do we need the creeds? We have the New Testament. And I said very simply, well, stand up next Sunday in church and recite the New Testament. <laughs> There's a practicality to that. You know, you boil it down to the basic statements of what you believe. It is a shorthand taken from the New Testament of what we believe and also what we don't believe, which are the heresies. Any questions about any of that? John. The the moratorium fragment, do they know who, who compiled that? No, they do not. But they do know the, the age of it. As I say, it's named after the guy that found it, not the guy that wrote it. All right, thank you folks for your patience and for listening to all this stuff. You don't have to remember all these people. I will tell you before the, the end of the course which ones you do need to remember.